good morning. It's Jim Vanderwell with the Fraser Basin Council. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, part of our First Nations Home Energy Save series. Um, today we're fortunate to have Robin Dawson from Zawatina um, First Nation to talk about uh, their solar hot water project. Um, for those of you that haven't participated in our webinars uh, yet, um, this is part of First Nations Home Energy Safe program, um, which is really all about helping um, communities to reduce energy use, um, share success stories about uh, what people are doing in community, uh, also building local capacity and opportunities for, for economic development in communities. And um, so we've been, uh, we've been at this for a few months now. Uh, and also had an in-person workshop earlier this week with a number of communities. Um, our work has been supported, uh, fortunately, by the Real Estate Foundation uh, of BC, uh, BC Hydro uh, Ministry of Energy and uh, Indigenous and Northern Affairs. And um, so today, uh, just a couple of logistical things. I've mentioned this before, but um, right now the audio is muted, so you won't be able to... Uh, to speak, but you can listen to the presentations right now. Um, when uh, our presentations are done, you'll be able to ask some questions um, using the either the question box on the screen, and you can type out your question, or you can also let us know that you'd like to ask a question there, and we can unmute you. And we do that just so that you can hear the speaker clearly. Um, if we unmuted you all, it would be it would be difficult to hear anything with all the background noise. And like, like it says, uh, any technical difficulty, just let us know uh, using the, the question box or chat function or uh, sending an email to FraserBasin at gmail.com. Um, so as I mentioned, today's presentation is from Robin Dawson, who's the, the Capital Projects Manager with Zawatina First Nation. And um, she's going to be talking about some work that, the, that they've done uh, to test out solar hot water in their community. Uh, and as you can see from the introductory pictures, uh, Zawatina is, is not in a very, uh, what you might think of as an ideal place for, for solar energy. Uh, they're on the, on the coast, uh, at Kinkham Inlet. Um, but, um, as you'll see, um, even in those conditions, um, they've had some, some pretty good success. So, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch over to her presentation, so just bear with me for one minute. <clears throat> and then we will pass things over to Robin. Oops. Okay, Robin, your presentation is up, so um, why don't you take things from here? All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, there was a bit of a crackle there. No, you sound clear, Robin. Great. Okay, as Jim mentioned, I'm Robin Dawson. I'm the Capital Project Manager of Policy Development as well from King Come and Let. Next slide, please. The Zaudan First Nation is part of the uh, Muskamuk Zaudan Tribal Council, and I just showed the little uh, red area in that map of where we're located. Okay, next. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Okay, our village, it's the only village that's lived in year round in our traditional territory. It's located in Kinkham Inlet on the river. It's about six kilometers upstream from the mouth of Kinkham Inlet. Um, the village is, is located on a flood plain and we do get floods. Our river came, did come up overnight. It's it kind of scary. The community is remote isolated. Um, we travel between Campbell River and here, and then Port McNeil or Alert Bay. Um, we can get a, a plane, a helicopter, or a boat ride. And it can take anywhere between 35 minutes 
on a plane up to two hours. Or if you're traveling by boat, it will be about two hours. And then yeah, and then by the time you get into the mouth of the river, you have to get a smaller boat, a river boat. And that can take between 10 minutes and 30 minutes, depending on the boat. Our current population is about 85. And it rises up to 100 people or more during the Ulican season and summer. Next slide. Uh, a little bit about the village profile, uh, the buildings that we have, and then the dependency on electricity. We do have a band office and finance office, and they're 100% dependent on electricity. We have an 11,000 square foot school and gymnasium, and that's about 99.9%. Uh, there's a 4,000 square foot health center, 100% uh, dependency on electricity. Um, our land and resource building, again, mostly electricity. Our old and new big house, um, very minimal, it only requires lighting and that, that's only when it's being used. Uh, our church is the same thing, 100% uh, dependency when, when it's in during the uh, winter or colder weather. We have about 46 homes, including a duplex and single unit teacherage. Um, it's about 75% reliability on electricity. Other sources of energy include propane. That would be for cooking or and drying your clothes. Um, a lot of people are using wood and, and now solar energy. 2011. And we also have a well house um, and a hotel building. Okay, next slide. Our power, we currently we're on generators. Um, I've been back in the village since 1980, and when I came back, we didn't have power. In the community, um, they did start working on getting power in the late 1970s, and then the generators were came into play in early 1980s. Um, we also had a hydro system late late 80s through the mid 90s. Um, and then from 1987 to 95, we had about 15 more homes added to the community. In the late 90s, the village had a large expansion with a new school and community center, a health center, um, the well system, other new van buildings, six new homes, new generator building system with four new generators. Um, at the same time that we were working on our generators, we were we did a feasibility study for a larger hydro project, yeah, but it was eventually deemed unfeasible by INAC due to the high cost of construction. Our energy consumption in 2010, um, the annual electricity production was 1.5 gigawatt hours. Average winter demand from January to March was 250, with a peak winter demand of 315 kilowatts. Average summer demand was from July to September was 80 kilowatts. And these figures came from a report that was done by uh, Morrow Engineering. Uh, they did uh, several remote communities in the province at that time. Today, the Southern First Nation is in serious uh, deficit financially due to the operations of our diesel generators. Uh, the high cost of running them. Um, so we have been desperately looking for alternative energy sources and solutions. Um, and there's been ongoing feasibility studies for run of river project. Next slide, please. I move to solar energy. Um, our village is situated 
on a north-south direction, um, therefore taking advantage of solar energy is possible. Um, we did we did try to do a, another project in 2009, but the company that we were working with at the time didn't really have a solid foundation, so we're, we were refused. Um, and then in attending workshops, um, one of the workshops I attended, we did a trip to the Soup First Nation to look at their solar project, and I was amazed um, at what they were able to accomplish with that. Um, from there, I was in communications with the province rep, and she further got me in touch with Solar BC. In mid 2010, Danielle Miles from the province and Nitya Harris from Solar BC and I were in communications about a possible project. And Nitya actually came to the village in 2010 and did a quick assessment and gave some feedback of what our possibilities were. And by late 2010, I signed on to a solar mentorship program through Solar BC, and my mentor was George Colgate from the Enigutina. Sorry about that butchering that, <laughs> um, who he, they had previously done similar projects. Next slide, please. So through the mentorship, um, one of the requirements for the mentorship was attending mentorship workshops. And again, that was done at Soup Nation. And that's where I discovered that even on the cloudy days that um, they were still producing energy. So I was like, wow, we need to get that in our village for sure. I um, also attended an energy conference in Vancouver. Um, George was at the same one, so we were able to connect and discuss the work that needed to be done. George and I further had further conversations through the phone and email. Um, he shared forms with me and gave feedback on what I worked on. Um, going forward with the project was certainly made easier with the help of George as well as Danielle and Nita and of course Tanya from the Fraser Basin Council was a huge help. And one of the things that we didn't have in place at the time that we were doing this project were policies um, regarding any projects like this demonstration project. Um, so that should have been in place to address strategic placement of the unit. So I decided, we, and we didn't have our, our committee to fall back on at the time, but I, I should have had some, something set up, but I didn't. Um, so I decided on myself, by myself that um, the system should go to homes that have large families. And to me, that was just logical. As the bigger families would use more hot water than the singles and couples. Another factor in the equation was that um, we did want to do monitoring of the system to find out how much energy we produced and energy was saved. Um, when one of the families didn't want the system, one of the big families didn't want the system, decided that it would go to my place so that I could do the monitoring. It, okay, next slide, please. So procedures, um, once locations were decided, the space for the units had to be made. So additional work included removing four old furnaces um, that were no longer in use. Um, working on the applications, advocating for all the funding, which, which came from several different places. I, I put on the revenues and the expenses on the side, you can see there. Um, budget, putting a budget in place, uh, terms of reference for the proposed work, um, call for proposals from industry, um, and negotiating the work and signing contracts. Um, drawbacks, of course for our community, drawbacks is the weather. It can pay, play a huge part in the success or failure of the 
a new project to which I found out. <laughs> and sure enough, the day that the guys first arrived with their equipment, uh, we were in flood preparation mode, and that could have gone either way. And luckily, the contractors were really down to earth and they accepted the situation, so there's no problems there. Okay, on to the next slide. Construction and training. Part of the project included capacity building, and training band members for future work and to help reduce maintenance costs. Um, unfortunately, lack of human resources is something that we deal with regularly. Um, I did post for trainee positions, but then no one came forward. It was just like the last minute the day the guys arrived that somebody said, okay, I'll I'll do it, but they still didn't get full, the full training. And then we were to include our operation maintenance worker, but he wasn't able to do that training either. So, yeah, that's difficult. Next slide. Um, the sun report. So, because we wanted to monitor how the system worked in our valley and to collect data for future projects, we added sun report to the system. Uh, and then it's a great product for determining how much energy the system produces and how much energy you save. From the pictures in my presentation, you can see that we have the wall panels and the roof panels. And from the initial data that we collected, it shows that the wall panels actually produce more energy, even though there was more shade. Um, so we did put uh, the sun reports in two different homes. So we weren't actually able to install the, the sun reports until the following spring. Um, so we, weren't, we didn't collect the data from the time that the systems were installed. Okay, next slide. Um, so monitoring, um, I, I took two pictures. And the great thing about the system is that you can check any time um, and even go back and look at the different uh, the dates. Uh, like I, I actually went back to 2012 when after they were installed and, and took that picture. Um, you can see the difference between 2012 and 2016. In a review in the community energy use annually, and I did that recently, um, the average home uses about 15,000 kilowatt hours per year. The system produces about 4,000 kilowatt hours per year. And I'd, I'd say that's a pretty good saving. Um, and then, and what I'm saying in, in there is that because we didn't start the monitoring right away, and then there are certain times that our internet gets interrupted, so we're not able to monitor it like 100% of the time. Um, so there is some discrepancy in the kilowatt hour shown now. Um, so the actual dollar saved for that is, is over $6,000, and that's just for one home. And that's based on the actual cost, operating cost of our generators. Okay, next slide. Energy audit and rebates. So my work wasn't finished. Um, part of the funding that I budgeted for for the whole project included rebates from the province and the federal government. So more work was required in, in getting that done. And it's, it's, quite the, it's quite the work involved, especially for a year. <laughs> I had a lovely time finding um, some people to come in. So it involves, um, God, I couldn't even remember the name of the, the companies. Involved uh, 
person that's certified to do these energy audits to come in and they do tests at each home and they're able to give you a report but they also have to come in after the work is all completed and let's see what uh, kind of savings there are. So at the end result is that we received seven thousand dollars, over seven thousand in rebates. So that was a plus. We we're actually able to have uh, a little bit of funding left over for for maintenance work. Okay, next slide. For future work, we are still monitoring the systems. Um, we purchased five years from Sun Report. And one thing for certain that solar energy does work here. Uh, the best thing about these systems is that they work even in cloudy situations. It's a shower, so long as it's bright, still bright out. And then we've been working with a company called Coho Power to reduce uh, energy uh, through demand side management. And I, I just spoke with our, our generator operator um, before our call here and asked them what, uh, what our loads looked like during the winter and summer. And they've gone down considerably from what's shown from 2010. Um, he said our, our current winter load is be on average between 160 to 170. And then our summer, summer loads have gone down from, from 80 to 40 to 50. So I, I that's a pretty good savings. Um, we do have a, an application into the BC Clean Energy Business Fund right now. And uh, we're certainly hoping that goes through for that will include um, a solar, uh, a combination solar, wood stove, hot water heating system. That will be a demonstration project. And if anyone anyone has uh, other ideas, please share them with us. Uh, like I said, we're in a huge deficit because of our generators, and we'd like to get out of it. <laughs> this concludes my presentation, and I'm sure I've missed a few things. It's been a while, so thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Robin. That's a great presentation. I'm sure uh, we've already got a few questions coming in. So like I said before, feel free to type your questions in that you have uh, as well. Um, you can let us know if you'd like us to unmute your, your audio if you want to ask your question. Um, but we do have one question here so far uh, from, from Dale says, how much maintenance is needed on the solar hot water system? Um, that, is, that is a good question. That's one of the things that we did ask the contract to do is to, and that was part of the training, was to show them how to do the maintenance. So we didn't get that full maintenance um, instruction. And and that's what we're, gonna, we're needing to do um, pretty quick is get back in here um, as we do have more money left over. So it's not, unless you're, unless you're damaging things, it's not really a whole lot of maintenance required. So you've had pretty, you, have, you haven't had systems go down on you? No. Four years? And, um, Related to that, somebody's asked, or Dale's also asking, what the life expectancy of these systems would be. Do you have an idea? I actually, I actually don't. I, I would have to look that up. Okay, well, we can follow up with with Dale on um, uh, between us, uh, Robin. Um, oh, someone's asked about the presentations being emailed to participants, and yes, uh, we can certainly do that. We'll make sure that they're. They'll be available afterwards uh, on our website, and we'll, we'll let people know about it. Um, and um, uh, question here from Patrick is, what was the total hard cost for the solar panels? I guess per house maybe would make the most sense. Do you have an idea, Robin? 
Well, just, just because of our location, it, it ended up being over 6,000 per house. Over 6,000 per house. And how much, did it, how much did it cost once they were all installed and everything? I'm just thinking about how quickly you're getting a payback on them. Um, you have an idea? Actually, no, it was more. I'll have to look at that. I was looking yeah. at yesterday, but I don't remember. I'll have to look at that and get back to you. Sounds good. Yeah, I seem to recall it was somewhere like maybe 15000 or a bit more. Once yeah. the freight and installation was included as well, but I can't. Yeah, it might have, it might have been the actual unit and not including everything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, a similar, a few people have a similar question around that. So hopefully we'll, we can perhaps follow up uh, after the webinar with that information. So I think that's useful. I mean, obviously you're getting a good, your payback will be improved because of the fact you, your electricity cost is, is quite a bit higher. So you're you're paying about 40 cent, 48 cents a kilowatt hour with the diesel generation, um, whereas uh, those that are on the grid would be obviously paying a lot less. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then you yeah, need to keep in mind we are remote isolated. So the cost of doing anything here, like, average is about 40%. You add 40% to actual work just for transporting, transporting anything in and out of here. Sure. And, yeah, so it's really expensive here, so don't, sure. don't use it as a benchmark. <laughs> no, well, there are some other remote communities that are that are on the line here, so that's helpful for them. But yeah, for others to keep in mind that they're not going to see quite the dollar savings uh, unless they've got a very, very sunny climate. Um, a question uh, from Graham about how much of the electricity in the community is currently supplied by diesel generators and how much is provided by the hydro plant. We actually don't have the hydro plant anymore. It's been out of commission well, since before the, the generators, the four generators were installed in, in the late 90s. So we're 100% on diesel. Okay. Okay. Um, there was someone as well that asked about whether they could follow up with you individually. So we can, we'll check in with you later about whether we can share any contact information. Um, sure. Uh where did the solar panels come from? Like, I guess this person, Patrick, is wondering whether he purchased them wholesale or uh, wholesale or from a retailer, or whether the contractor supplied it as part of a, a package for you. The contractor supplied it. Okay. As the package. So you had them bid on the entire piece, like installation and everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, Question from Ben about, will these, these types of systems stand up to harsh northern winters where you get heavy snow loads and cold down to minus 40? I don't know if you know the answer to that. We can certainly follow up with the suppliers around that kind of question. Yeah, exactly. Um, that was a question from Lynn here. I'm just trying to understand. Maybe Lynn, it says it's. Is it a standard electric hot water tank with extra costs, re solar panels, and extra wiring? Um, maybe you could just re ask that question in a different way, Lynn. I don't quite understand it, or I can unmute you if um, if you prefer to ask it out uh, on the on your phone. Um, while you're thinking about that, the next question is: How many panels are on the house that generated? Uh, 6,240 in savings over the last uh, four years or so. There's two panels per house. Two panels per house, okay. Okay, so uh, maybe this is Lynn's follow-up question is, can solar panels be added to an existing hot water tank? Again, that's a... Because it's just a backup, it's not it's not a main system, a standalone system. It's just backup to your current electric uh, or your current hot water system. Right, right, yeah. Now, did you did they did remind me again with your installation? Did they add an an extra holding tank as well? 
or is it just yeah. yes so you've got the panels you've got your existing hot water tank and then there's an additional tank as well that would be involved yeah. you do need a bit of space you do yeah Okay, well, um, we do have time for more questions if anybody has questions. Um, seeing we just got a little bit of a lull here, maybe I just uh, I'm going to ask a poll question, which is um, for those on the line, um, which is, you should see it come up in a, in a moment here, which is what is the top challenge that your community faces in improving energy efficiency? So feel free to let us know what you feel you're your top challenges here. And once everyone's had a chance to, now obviously there's many challenges, but just uh, from your opinion on what might be the top challenge. And then we can show you what the results are once everyone's had a chance to, to weigh in on that. Okay, well, I think it uh, looks like, um, for those that have responded here, that affordability of renovations and maintenance seems to be one of the, one of the bigger concerns at the moment. Um, so that's really helpful information to have around, um, around these projects. Now, do we have any more questions here? Oh, yes, we have one more from Cole, another one as well. Um, uh, maybe it's more of a comment. It says th solar thermal panels can be designed to, for any uh, climate, but northern climates don't get as much sun, so a longer payback. Oh, that's a good point. Um, uh, further comment or question here from Patrick. Uh, solar works, but uh, it's still so new despite the age. How do we learn more about solar and how to do it? I don't know if that's quite, that might be more more of a question, uh, a broader question um, here, and and perhaps you know that's something that we can take into consideration as part of our initiative to think about if there is if there are a number of communities that have an interest in learning more about uh, solar. That that might that that's certainly what we did um, a few years ago when there were, was a group um, you know designing some sort of mentorship and training around that so that people can um, share information. Um, and um, there are, you know, there are some people, um, you know, Robin obviously has developed some experience here as well. Um, she mentioned George Colgate, who works with Honey Gatine in the, in the interior, who's also got a fair bit of experience. So that can be a very effective way of trying to, um, to facilitate some of that learning because it's easy to find somebody with, you know, a lot of technical information, but for those who've actually um, implemented and been able to test it out, um, uh, another comment that they need to be maintained in the winter by removing the snow or that can be automated to move from coal. Um, and yeah, cool. <laughs> thanks for the suggestions, Cole. There's certainly Souk is another community uh, that's, uh, that's done a lot of work here as well and, and uh, would have, you know, they've been very willing to share information. Um, for those of you that have been able to see their uh, what they've done, it's very impressive. <clears throat> uh, comment from Dale, probably maybe people can see, is that um, he provided some funding to look at feasibility of wind, solar, and geothermal, and uh, and their community uh, is looking at going with solar uh, photovoltaics. Um, Another uh, question here from Patrick. I think this would be, be useful for others to hear about as well. Robin mentioned demand side management, and uh, Patrick's wondering, if, Robin, if you could just elaborate a bit around what the community's done so far on demand side management. Um, we've done. Uh, we've replaced um, standard. Uh, street lights with uh, LED lights, um, and then they provide the 
company provided um, LED lights for the homes, um, as well as changing um, or putting in thermostats in our band, all our band buildings, changing all the lights in the buildings, the band buildings. Um, what else? Cool can probably answer better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've um, and and our, as I mentioned, that our generator operator says what we've done has made a, a big difference and. Like he's really interested himself in a solar panel for his home, and I'd like to invest in that. Um, another, I guess, question here from Bruce is: Have you considered solar heat pumps to provide space heating and hot water? Solar heat pumps. I guess maybe not. So perhaps that can be a topic for, for a future discussion. Um, or if there's a community that's already implemented, it, we could share that information. So Bruce, feel free to follow up with us around that if you've got some suggestions around how that's been implemented. Um, question from uh, Bruce McKenzie is, how do you keep all the complex systems like electricity, water supply, septic tanks, propane, Wood heaters, chimneys, vehicles, roads, and now solar heating all running in your remote community with so few residents. How do, can you repeat that? <laughs> I think he's just, it's more of a general comment, is how do you keep all this going? It's obviously you've got a lot going on in a small community, so how do you, how do you keep everything running well, all your systems, your electricity and propane and wood and so on? Um, yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably an understatement, uh, Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, um, Unless there are any other last minute burning questions that people would want to ask, um, I think we'll probably uh, draw things to a close and um, thank Robin for um, giving a great presentation. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to put that together and I, I think we've all uh, learned something out of it. Um, for those uh, on the webinar, we will be um, distributing the information out afterwards, including the, the link to the presentation on our on our website. If anyone has questions or follow-ups, certainly feel free to email Elena at Chia, which she should have her email from the from, from the registration process, um, or get in touch with, with either of us. Um, just wanted to thank our, our supporters and funders as well. Again, um, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, um, BC Hydro, uh, INAC, and uh, the BC Ministry of Energy and Mines. And so um, we hope to be continuing to, to do these over the next uh, few months and are uh, just working on the topics uh, for those um, webinars coming up. So uh, we're always interested as well from in, in hearing from you. So if, if there's anything that you would like to learn about or hear about, um, feel free to get in touch with us. Well, thanks again and um, have a good day, everyone. <laughs>